Good morning. I purposely asked for the lights to come on. So if everybody just stand up, please. See, I'm a, re I'm a retired lieutenant colonel, you know, so I like to make sure that everybody's awake, okay, stretch a little bit in between briefings. It's always good. It's good. It's good. And then when we get to a little bit of question and answers, you know, I need to hear you because, you know, I've been in the service for a long time, almost 20, well, really 27 years. So a little bit of hard hearing. So just speak up, please. Okay, everybody have a, go ahead and have a seat. All right. Now that I have everybody's attention, my name is Bernard Harris, as you can see on the slide. I am a student just like you. I'm attending classes uh, for my PhD in adult education. Well, it's actually called adult uh, learning and leadership, but it's dealing with adult education and from uh, Kansas State University, and I've been allowed to do my dissertation, well, it's actually a historiography dissertation, on the education and training of the African-American men who attended the officer training camps, because there was actually two, and I'll talk about both of them, at Fort Des Moines, Iowa, it was just a few miles south of here. Now, I find this rather fascinating subject, and hopefully by the time I'm finished, you will too. Uh, my direct connection to World War I is the fact that my great uncle uh, was a stevedore down in Bordeaux, France. And he was offloading ships from 1917 to 1919 before he came back. As far as I know, he was not affected with, the influ with influenza um, on my mother's side, but I'm still doing research on that. So, if you want to actually read my actual article, um, it's in the Annals of Iowa Journal, and you see what the volume is, and it was put out last summer, and I just received word that I've been recognized as a nominee for the Army Historical Foundation 2018 quarterly, well, 2018 um, article award. So I'm a nominee, but it hasn't gone through yet. So I'm pretty happy about that, but the main reason why I'm saying it is not to not to turn around and show off, is to turn around and tell you that stories are out there in history that need to be told. I highly encourage everybody in here to start doing some research into your family, see what kind of connections you had with World War I, and then you turn around and you start writing, and eventually you'll go from high school to college, and hopefully on to a doctorate, and then at that point, you'll, have, you'll be recognized as a lot more of an expert, but you'll have a, f a family connection, or you might have a close friend connection to whatever you're researching. And it makes it a little bit more interesting to you. Okay, so as you can see, this is my overall title, in which case I'm chipping away at the bedrock of racial intolerance. Now, the world I'm talking about was a little over 100 years ago. In 1917, we had a segregated military. Most of the American society was segregated. And for the purposes of this brief, I'm just gonna talk white and black. When I say white, that's pretty much everyone of non-color. When I say black, I'm talking about African Americans in particular for this particular story. So you had a different world back then. We had a segregated military because of that. And one of the main reasons was right at the top the Supreme Court turned around and made a decision that the federal government would not interfere with states' laws. So especially in the southern states, they were heavy on segregation, in which case they were pretty much blacks had to sit in certain areas, whites had to sit in certain areas. What that did was it created the era of what you've been uh, heard as Jim Crow, but what that's also doing is that it causes over here on the left-hand side where it says segregation, up in the north, you still had segregation, but you had northern migration. A lot of folks in the south were trying to get north because the situation was just a little bit better. You weren't segregated as much, and there was work to be had as far as people working in the factories. As you already heard from the first briefing as far as World War I and American involvement, the story I'm talking about pretty much starts in the very beginning of that war effort. Question? So it starts in the very beginning of the war effort. So down south, what they're trying to, what those people down south were trying to move away from 
Number one, lynching, not necessarily a good thing when you get dragged out and hung from a tree. It also had a law down there called vagrancy. That wasn't good either. Vagrancy was that if you were found out on the street, say at the store, but you didn't have permission from your employer to be away from the factory, I mean written permission, the sheriff could pick you up and throw you in jail. And then the judge would pronounce sentence on you, in which case you could be farmed out to a prison camp and then sent to a, a, a mine or to a railroad company, in which case they literally worked you to death. And there was nothing that was going to be done about it. Okay? Now, and then also segregation was very severe down in the South. Now, one of the biggest things is you had, since this big migration was going on, a lot of black people were moving north, there was a big issue down south because now there was not enough labor to work the farms. And America, in a lot of ways, is still a very agricultural society. So that caused a major issue. Now, we had two other events that popped up. You got the 24th Infantry Division mutiny. If you don't know uh, a lot of details about that, I highly encourage you to look on the Library of Congress or the National Archives to look that up. But the bottom line is that was an event in which case the local sheriff in the town of Houston, along with a lot of his police force, were really accused of harassing the soldiers of the 24th Infantry Regiment who were guarding Camp Logan. Camp Logan was being set up for the war effort, and these troops were just down there to guard it. Well, the local um, police force and population were kind of harassing them. That was the charge. The soldiers turned around and decided they had enough, and they went and got their weapons and went downtown, and you ended up with quite a few people passing away. Now, in my particular story, we had five cadets that actually claimed Houston as their home. And so now you don't really know, and I'm doing the research now as far as what kind of impact that had on them. Also, you had uh, race riots in uh, St. Louis. There were quite a few smaller race riots at the time. I would highly encourage you to go to newspaper.com, newspapers.com, and you have to register. But you can turn around and look at all these newspapers back from 1917. Just start looking up months, September, October, November, and you can start seeing what everyday people were looking at, because guess what? That was their internet. A common person back then could have anywhere from six to seven pa papers in their house every day, okay? Because they didn't have their phone. They didn't have your high-speed internet. You didn't have all that. You physically received a newspaper, you went out and bought one. Now, we had nine cadets that were actually affected by the race riots. Again, I'm doing some more research as far as how much they were affected. Now, to start off with, war is declared in April. Come up May, the Army is really scrambling to try to get their act together because just like a lot of things in the United States government, we turned around and we weren't ready. And now we have to catch up. So at this point, the U.S. military is scrambling to get enough officers for all these new draftees they're about to draft. African Americans not being different from that, in which case it was a big push of patriotism throughout uh, the United States at the time. As you see down at the bottom where I have a patriotic movement, quite a few people were pro-French, pro-British, and against the Germans. It, and also to kind of hype that up was some of the posters that were shown earlier as far as the, the beast that was holding Lady Liberty. Okay, that just got everybody all riled up. So on the African American community, First off, when you went down to the recruiting office, that was a big deal. These guys actually put on their Sunday best to enlist in the Army. Okay? Now, they had already been reading about how many people were dying overseas for like the last, from 1914, and now it's 1917. So they already know that they're going into a meat grinder, but they volunteered anyway. Especially the guys that are going to the officer training camps. They're volunteers. They're not drafted. They're volunteers. So... For one thing, you see here I have a card, okay? And this is Charles Houston's military draft card, registration draft card, and I'll talk a little bit more about him a little bit later. The significance about this is, now, how would you like it if you were singled out in your class and you took a test and the teacher only cut the corner of your particular test, nobody else's? Of course, what are you going to say? Why are you doing that? Well, they were cutting the corner of every African American that was enlisted. That created a big stink in the African-American community. It's like, why do you keep cutting our stuff? You're, put, you're, you're signing on the top that says Negro, okay, got it. But why you still got to mutilate my paper, okay? So those are some of the smaller things 
that really was feeding into the, this entire segregation issues. And segregation pretty much means racism, all right? Now, eventually, we actually put, they actually sent out notice through the newspapers, and they're asking for volunteers to become officers because they know we're going to have almost 84, initially, we're going to look at about 50,000 being brought in by the draft. Initially, that number rose up to 80,000 and eventually had quite a few more, over a few hundred thousand African Americans coming in. Well, if I have that many people coming in, I need officers for them. So at this point, I'm asking for volunteers to be officers. Initially, the War Department was solicited by a gentleman known as Dr. Spingarn, who really pushed, and he was director of the NAACP, but guess what? He was an African American, he was Jewish. And he was a former Columbia University professor. And I've seen his personal papers, if anybody's interested in that, you gotta go to New York Public Library on 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue in New York City. Okay, but very influ influential individual. Eventually, he actually gets uh, commissioned in the Army as a major in the infantry. But he's really pushing the War Department with the rest of the NAACP to get African Americans, an African American officer training camp to train up African American officers for to take over and run these black units that are getting ready to stand up with the new draftees. So. That 1,500 of volunteers eventually whittled down to 1,250, and as you can see, 250 were NCOs, but some of them were actually privates, okay? So this is a pretty good deal. If you've already been in the Army for 10, 4, 10 12, almost 15 years, you go to three months training, and you go from NCO to officer, and in some cases, straight to captain. Sounds great, right? Looks good, nice uniform but I'll talk about the problems of that here in a few minutes. So now, location, we're looking for a location. We'll say Howard University or some other locations. Eventually they fit, fit, um, settle on Fort Des Moines, mainly because Fort Des Moines already had black troops here back in the early part of the turn, uh, turn of the century, and there was no big problems, okay? As we, as we see, we already got problems as far as racism down south. So now, Fort Des Moines is picked, and the Army is advertising age 20, 20 years to nine months or uh, up to 44. However, some Southern newspapers actually turned around and said, no, you could come in if you're age 30. Nobody younger than 30, okay? That's going to guarantee problems here in a few minutes when I get to it. Now, down at the very bottom, you're looking at, a, it, depending on which papers you, sources you look at, anywhere from 14 to 16 officer training camps for whites were already set up throughout the country. We pretty much had two officer training camps, both at Fort Des Moines, set up um, starting in uh, June for the infantry and then starting in July for the medical. Now, we move forward to June. So last slide was May, now we're moving forward to June. In June, that 1,250 volunteers are about to take an oath, okay? In which case, when you join the military, you raise your right hand, you're pretty much volunteering. Well, guess what? In their oath, they're told this. That whole quote, that's a quote there in the box given by Colonel Blue, who was appointed as a commander of the infantry camp. Now, how would you like somebody to tell you that? Okay, let that sink in for a minute. I mean, no pressure, right? No, no, uh-uh. What are you talking about? Pressure? What? No, if I screw up, that doesn't just affect me, it affects everybody, okay, because that was the situation at that time. Every action that each one of these individuals took was going to be put under a microscope. Now, there was a big controversy. Blue wasn't supposed to be the initial person everybody wanted to run the infantry camp. They originally wanted Lieutenant Colonel Promotable Charles Young to do it. Only problem was Charles Young got caught up in the politics of the day. And one of the biggest things that the Army was doing at that time was, if they didn't like you, they made you take a physical. And if you really look at, oh no, that's very true. And if you look at the issues when General Pershing was picked to command the Army, uh, the AEF, the American Expeditionary Force, it was a big fight between him and General Linderwood. General Linderwood was a medical officer, but he had a lot of pull up on Capitol Hill. However, Pershing was picked because Pershing was really better physical health, okay? 
the Secretary Baker actually went out and walked around with General Linderwood, and General Linderwood was having a hard time just breathing. All right? So they made General Linderwood have to go get a physical, and guess what? They pretty much was like, sir, you're, you're, you're not going overseas with the rest of the force. Well, that's what happened to Charles Young. President uh, Woodrow Wilson, really nice individual, okay? However, he actually watched the movie Birth of a Nation, and that movie Birth of a Nation, if anybody's ever seen it, is rather derogatory towards African Americans, okay? Well, President Wilson actually, that was the first movie shown in the White House, and he actually watched that with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and they both said, that was a great movie. Yeah, okay, let you make a judge of that one, all right? But that's documented fact. So, President Wilson really didn't like the fact that uh, Charles Young was gonna be, a, could be a uh, 06 colonel in charge of white officers, so they turned around and sent him for a medical, and eventually they came up and said that he had bright disease, which a uh, symptom of that is high blood pressure, and they forced him to retire. So he's out of the picture. Also, down here in the bottom, you'll see that uh, Colonel Blue, eventually he gets promoted up to Brigadier General and takes over the 92nd Division, but at this point in the story, he has uh, 12 West Point officers with him um, to be the actual instructors, because at this point, the officer was the actual training officer. The officer, the lieutenant, would train his platoon. That captain would train his company, okay? It, there was really no delegation down to the NCOs. The NCOs, their main function was just to take care of the health and welfare of the individual soldier. So, interesting about that was there was actually one black officer from the 8th Illinois, which eventually turned into the, three, uh, the 370th Infantry Regiment with the 93rd Division. So there was actually a black officer there that was training cadets, black cadets to become black officers. Okay, so that was unique. The Army did say one standard, one standard, we got two segregated camps, one standard. Later on, that pro also proves to be a little problematic. And then I wanted to point out about Mrs. Uh, Talbert. She was a big wig at the time. She actually shows up right before the camp starts, and the governor actually has an audience with her, and act they actually take her out to a tour of Fort Des Moines before the camp actually starts up. So she was... I wanted to make sure that I was trying to include everybody and I came across her story and I felt that was, that was important to include. Oh, one last thing, W.E.B. Du Bois, he was the editor at this time of the crisis and he was really pushing for African Americans to get involved in the war. There were other newspapers out there like The Messenger who were really kind of pushing that blacks shouldn't get involved in the war. So there was mixed issues in the African American community. Next, camp begins. Infantry camp in June of 1917. This is a daily schedule, as you can see on the left. The biggest thing that jumps out at me is the fact that they have sick call at 4.45 in the afternoon. In the modern military, sick call is first thing in the morning. So that's a little bit different, okay? Also, you could get an idea of what they were eating. And then, when you look at old photos, I highly encourage you to really dig into those old photographs. Because if you take a hard look at these two pictures right here, you'll see gentlemen in civilian clothes and some in uniform. My projection, is, my thought is, is that this is pretty much early in the training process. These are actual photos that were taken over at Fort Des Moines and I have copyright release on it, okay? But this was taken early in the process, so that's already showing you that the Army does not have enough equipment immediately for everybody to receive and everyone to look be in a proper uniform. A lot of those pictures you see with World War I is at the end of the war when everybody has everything. But in the beginning of the war, everybody doesn't. Okay, another thing to look at. Again, looking at these pictures. Some of the stuff you can see on here is the fact that everybody doesn't have the equipment they need for the class. This particular class is how to make maps. Because at this point, you didn't just receive maps of the terrain that you were on. The officers would have a little tablet and they'd have a little string around their neck with a pencil and they put a piece of paper on the tablet and that would actually get classes on topography, how to sketch out your map of the area that you're in in order to set your sector on where your troops were gonna be. And then you take that copy and you pass that up from platoon up to company, company would compile it to a bigger one, they'd give that up to battalion, which would put it in a bigger one, they'd give it up to division, put it in a bigger one. 
okay? So that was a class that they are participating in right now. But as you can see, just the gentleman in the front rank actually had the equipment. The other guys behind them are waiting, okay? A few other things to look at is we're sitting on stools. That's not the most comfortable thing to sit on for class, you know, for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Also, we had box fans at this point, but guess what? A box fan is not an air conditioner. That's just going to blow more hot air on you, okay? And this is June. Uh, you got chalkboards, real chalkboards, okay? Um, in the barracks, that was also the little mini mess halls because you had one barracks building for each one of the uh, companies. And then um, one other thing to point out, we had lawyers here. So the gentleman that actually volunteered, that 1,000 um, volunteers that were college graduates, and I'm finding out that some of them um, actually weren't college graduates. I'm finding out that some of them just had high school. So because each one of the Army departments, the entire country were broken up into six different departments, and each department had a quota. So in some cases, they just didn't have enough African Americans who had been graduate, graduated high school to actually go, but those departments still had a quota. So if you had a high school diploma, they sent you. And that, again, proved rather problematic a little bit later. You also had several gentlemen from various fraternities that were there that had just started up around the turn of the century, so that was also a big deal. And as you can see, Howard University, Tuskegee, and Wilberforce University also contributed quite a few people. Now, if you go over to Fort Des Moines right now, you'll see the modern buildings. However, I would tell you don't go wander around over there because that's a prison, okay? It's a minimum security prison. I made that mistake. I was driving around, all of a sudden I see this big sign. If you go past this point, you agree to surveillance and to be searched. Ooh, not good. Turn around, <laughs> okay? However, you can walk out on the, parade, on the parade field, which is that grassy area right in front of the building. Okay, training, education. As you can see, they had lectures, they had conferences. And with those lectures and conferences, pretty much they were sitting in their barracks buildings just like you and the instructor was talking to them. They would be going over manuals. They would be explaining to them and have, trying to have some engagement as far as, okay, what does chapter two mean, okay, as far as how to do guard duty? What does chapter three mean as far as how to actually execute military um, UCMJ, in which case you talk about military justice? Because the officers were pretty much, that was the first line as far as if a soldier messed up, they would definitely have to go and talk to that lieutenant who would almost pronounce sentence on them based on his rec that lieutenant's recommendation to the co company commander and then also up to the battalion commander. So they're going through military manuals and learning different things during these conferences. And then they're actually out in the field actually doing stuff. And as you can see, the course was supposed to be three months. First month's training is on the left. Second, uh, the second two months of training is on the right-hand side. And I've got two things highlighted down here in red, which is machine guns and artillery. That led to a problem as far as the cadets not trusting Colonel Blue, because Colonel Blue, depending on which source you're looking at, was having a hard time deciding how many guys out of this 1,250 I can actually commission, because I've got some people in here that are just not getting it. And see, the problem with that is, Segregation doesn't work. Separate but equal doesn't work because eventually you're going to have to lower the standards for one or the other, okay, in order to be able to meet the numbers. So, Colonel Blue turns around and says, I just don't think that these guys are really smart enough to be, to get and receive infantry and uh, artillery training. And besides that, the decision was made. Originally, the Army was actually going to integrate. Secretary Baker was like, I'm gonna put one regiment of black troops inside of every white division. But then President Wilson got a hold of that and said, no, nah, we're not doing that. So then you came out with the entire African-American unit, the 92nd Division, which um, uh, Mr. Morris was in, Lieutenant Morris, who has his sword and uniform here in, in, here in the museum, and I encourage everybody to take a look at it. You had the 92nd Division, eventually you get the 93rd Division. So they were, that's how the Army was situated. We got a question? We good? Okay. So, one other thing. True today, just like it was in 1917, the training we received wasn't the right stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
okay? Wasn't right. In which case, you actually had people who actually went over to the war zone, to France, actually watching the fighting, American officers actually watching the fighting, came back to the United States, told General Pershing and the rest of the, of the command staff, sir, certain things we're teaching aren't quite right. For one, signal. In which case, we still had manuals and we're teaching the guys to go out there with little semaphore flags, similar to how the Navy uh, signal ships. In which case, you would actually have a person in the company with two flags in their hands signaling the platoons in the company on how to move on the ground. Well, what do you think is going to happen if somebody stands up above the trench in World War I and starts waving a flag? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Almost a guarantee like the sun coming up. Okay, so guess what? When they actually got to France, they took those little flags off the poles, rolled them up, wrapped them around their neck to catch sweat, or use them for pillows. Okay, wrong training. So that's one thing you even to equate to us in modern day. Take a look at your training. Is that the right stuff or is that the wrong stuff? And if it's the wrong stuff, you need to change it. Okay. However, our American Expeditionary Force with General Pershing really was kind of arrogant and didn't want to pay attention to some of the lessons learned by these guys over there. Sir? I heard a fellow say about Jackson, he was too tall. Uh, Jackson said he was a captain too. Um, and I wish that he would give himself up and uh, in the classes about how to do what he did to his team for some time too. So he was just too tall. And that and that's correct, because one of the things, one of the things was, that's, re that's really not the greatest English, but one, <laughs> one of the issues were, in the modern military right now, when you, if you go into the service, they're going to put you through a gas uh, exercise, in which case you actually put your protective mask on, actually go inside of a room, in which case they release gas, okay? Most likely it's going to be tear gas for training. And then you'll come out of the room, and you'll take your mask off, and some of that gas will get to you, Okay, and eventually you'll have a little bit of symptoms from it, but it's to give you an idea of what that gas can do to you. They weren't doing that in the beginning of the war in World War I because they didn't have enough chemical gas to use for training. Everything we had and what we were putting together was immediately going to the front, okay? And then we also had situations in which case we had the troops put chemical masks on and charge an enemy trench, in which case a problem with the trenches were Sometimes they would just show them how to dig a straight trench and it wasn't a zigzag trench. A zigzag trench is what you want. The straight trench, the enemy gets on one side, he can kill anybody going, he just shoot straight down one side and kill everybody. That's why you want a zigzag trench. Okay, so that way they can't shoot all the way down and, and hurt anyone. And you can hide behind those corners to, to go back at the enemy. Well, the point is with the gas is that they would have these guys put their protective masks on, charge out of their trench, charge the enemy trench, because at this point, it's all about the bayonet. The army is all about fix bayonets and charge the enemy. Well, they didn't put the guys under realistic conditions, in which case they didn't have simulators going off. They didn't have simulated machine gun fire. So you didn't have any of the noise and the confusion or the smoke of an actual battlefield. You just had a couple of guys get up out of a ditch and run across the, the grass to the other side of the ditch. Okay? Not very good. In a World War I battlefield, you had by wire you had to deal with. Okay? You had the rats too. All right? Just what I was pointing out before. But the rats were kind of an afterthought when they turned around and said, we're going over the top. You had barbed wire you had to negotiate. You had mud you had to negotiate. You had machine guns you had to deal with. You got artillery falling on you. And all of a sudden, you might see this green cloud coming at you, okay? Not good, all right? So you should train in the environment that you're gonna be in. And again, that's a, that's a point for modern people today. Train as you're going to execute the mission. Train as you fight is one of the things we talked about in the modern military. Okay, now getting down to the end of the infantry camp is the fact that we had folks that were really lacking in education, as you can see. Colonel Blue didn't want to have evaluations returned, in which case all the college graduates were maxing out on scores, and the NCOs, the 250 NCOs, who barely had a 6th and 8th grade education, and their writing wasn't even close to being up to speed. So he said, hey, 
I need these young college educated kids to work with the, the NCOs, so we need, to, the, we need to keep them together and we need them to work with each other, so he chose not to give back written evaluations. Well, that is what I was talking about earlier as far as part of when you have separate but equal, you run into a situation in which case the standards are lowered for one of those two. And that is where the standards were lowered a little bit as far as the black officer training camps. Now, these guys, as far as adult education, it was rote learning, in which case I tell you, you repeat back. I tell you again, you do it, and then you repeat back. Okay, it's not a whole bunch of experiential learning. We're not learning from each other. I'm dictating to you, and that's pretty much it. Okay? Also, they were infighting because guess what? A lot of these non-commissioned officers who only had 6th and 8th grade education, who had been in the military for 10 or 15 years so they knew how the Army worked, these were the guys getting promoted to captain. The problem is they ain't ready. That would be like you being a freshman on the football team and, and after you know, one year and you're supposed to be a sophomore, they turn around and tell you you are now in charge. Okay, you're JV. You're not ready. You might think you're ready, and a few of you, very few, might be, but for the most part, you're not ready. You have to go through these steps in order to get ready. You have to earn that experience. So, the other big thing was graduation got uh, moved back by 30 days. Bottom line was Uncle Sam was not ready to receive all these African-American draftees that were coming in, okay? And since they weren't ready, they didn't want to have these officers standing around with nothing to do. In the modern military, <laughs> we ain't worried about that, okay? We're going to put you there real quick so that way you can get everything ready for the troops coming in. But at that point, they didn't do that. So they actually delayed them. Problem is, now think of this. You've invited your mom, your grandparents, and all your friends to come to this graduation ceremony. You get notified three days before the graduation ceremony that graduation is not going to happen. Well, they decided not to cancel everything and to still have graduation. And when they did that, everybody still showed up, but they weren't getting no diplomas. They had to wait around for another 30 days. Now, at this point, that killed the morale of quite a few of the cadets. And at this time, a lot of them left. It's just like if you go to basic training, some of you might turn around and decide to go into the military and you go to basic training. If you can't cut it, especially after the first few days, they will let you leave, go home, no harm, no foul, nothing against you, and you're good to go. Okay? You don't necessarily want to do that, but I would tell you the military is not for everybody, so it happens. Now, graduation actually does happen on the 15th of October of 1917, and we had a low success rate because a lot of guys either left or they got washed out because they just didn't have the education to cut it. And by the simple fact that a lot of s southern states had invited high school uh, guys, high school and 30 years and older, to actually attend the camps, they couldn't hang with the academics. And so you had a low, uh, low graduation rate. And then finally, the Army did accomplish one mission, in which case they did start doing some integrating. In which case, African Americans that were coming in that wanted to be officers after this, they actually did go to officer training camps and they were there with their white counterparts actually going through. And I uh, lived down in Leavenworth, Kansas, and I worked down at, uh, as a volunteer down at the World, National World War I Museum and Memorial. And we've got pictures down there. Uh, Jonathan Casey, the curator, he has pictures of uh, Camp uh, Zachary Taylor over in Kentucky, which is a field artillery camp, in which case you have white and black troops in the same picture. Don't see that too often, but it happened. But do they publicize it? No. You have to go and dig for it, okay? Now, last thing I was going to talk about is the medical camp. We had two camps going on. We had an infantry camp and we had a medical camp. In the medical camp, these guys were straight up doctors already. They had already graduated college. They had graduated medical school. Again, they had already been reading about the death and destruction over in Europe already, okay? They still volunteered anyway. So we started off with 108, finished up 12, getting into the medical with the influenza. Okay, these guys were studying bacteria. They were actually studying medical issues. And then we had, uh, but they were short staffed. So some of the cadets were actually picked to be instructors because they were just that knowledgeable in their subjects. As you can see, 
The training period for the doctors was a little bit more disjointed from the infantry, in which case these doctors were showing up at the medical camp to train at odd times. And then uh, their evaluations were all graded. This is real quick as far as the schedule that they did. The biggest thing for these doctors was they needed to learn how the Army did business. They already knew how to do business as far as the medical side. And then right down here, Howard University was one of the main universities that was cranking out medical doctors. For the doctors, their ultimate test was right down here in the bottom. They had to keep their troops healthy. If their troops started dying, they were failing. And then as you can look over on the, the, the your right-hand side, they graduate in November. They had better analytical skills, so more of them graduated, as you can see, their graduation rates. And they were in charge of a lot more stuff than those infantry officers were. So they were actually in charge of their clinics, in which case they were taking care of troops. Now, my very last slide, two key people out of this. One, Charles Houston. He turns around and graduates Fort Des Moines. He goes on to be the mentor for Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall becomes the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. However, right before Thurgood Marshall goes to the Supreme Court, he actually litigates the court cases that lead to the successful Brown versus Board of Education, in which case that pretty much ended segregation in schools and began the entire civil rights process. So that's a direct link between Fort Des Moines and the modern world that we live in today. Because in 1917, Myself and anybody else that's African-American here, we wouldn't be in the same room at the same time talking. It just wasn't going to happen. Okay? Now, also Lieutenant Wright, as you can see right here, he was big because he was one of, the, um, one of the cadets in the medical camp. His big claim to fame, I mean, this guy was just straight up smart. Okay? He actually improved smallpox for the Army. All right? He saw it wasn't working and he improved it. And... That pretty much concludes my brief.